This is Rich Bischoff with New Time Music Producers. I'm here at uh, June Audio today with Scott Wiley. Scott, buddy, thanks for doing this. Yeah, thanks for coming down. We just got done talking about a bunch of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Rich, don't admit that but, <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. Um, but so I kind of wanted to start out by just kind of getting to know you. I, I know I, I kind of cyber stalked you online and, and I did the, the Google tour of the studio. Oh, yeah, yeah. But it's awesome to really be here and see it, how it really is, all messy as it is. It is. It's very <laughs> messy right now. I'm in the middle of a project right now. And when I do when I, the, this kind of project, I'm producing, so I'm playing a lot of stuff and I'm bringing in musicians as I need them. And um, I, I tend to not clean up. So yeah, I just continue to set things up and... It's awesome. It gets very um, so, tell me a little bit about where you started, and uh, I know you, we talked earlier. You you're from California, which yeah. is cool. From Southern California, I grew up there. Um, always was into music. I went to. Uh, I started. I had a studio starting in like ninth grade with a little reel to reel, and started recording local bands and friends and my own stuff, and then went to USC for to study recording. And then had internships uh, all through, um, all through college, and then you know by the end of college had jobs. Right. And then uh, after college, I moved here kind of just to get away from LA for a little while, and ended up staying, um, building a studio, working at other places around, working. At, I worked at Solarium and Counterpoint and LA East, uh, up in Salt Lake and. And um, then kind of had my own place on the side. Right. Um, then June Audio, we built it in a house downtown in downtown Provo. And we built it up and it was running well. We had an offer to sell that. So we sold the business and moved to, back to LA, my wife and I. Well, I had a question about that because was it once called Junior Audio? No, that was... Is that just when, a, I don't... When, I, no, yeah, I know. Yeah. It's confusing. When I, when I moved back, um, when I moved back to Utah from LA the second time, <laughs> um, which was eight years ago or so, or nine years ago. Um, somebody had, was running June Audio, because right. I had sold the company to somebody else. Okay. So somebody was running it as June Audio. When you came back? Yeah, okay, gotcha. and so okay. they were in this room, gotcha. where we are now. Okay. And there's a little B studio behind the wall here. So then I just needed an email address, so we were Junior Audio. <laughs> and oh, this really? Junior Audio. <laughs> so you were over here? We were next right, door. right next door in gotcha. the little room. Okay. And then um, and then we had the chance to take over this space to get the name back and to kind of okay. gotcha. go back to being Gene Audio, so that, that's what yeah. happened. Because I don't, I, for some reason, I think when I was uh, doing some Google searches about you, Junior Audio, maybe your yeah. blog or something. Oh, you know, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Probably. I, 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 <laughs> uh, anyway, so you're in California. Um, you guys, I know we talked earlier, you the lifestyle out there, just yeah. the working hours and stuff like that. By the time we moved back to California and I, you know, I'd been, I was then married, I had two kids and it was a regular six day a week, maybe seven. And it was 12 to 14 hours a day. Wow. Um, and so career wise, things were going great and I was doing better than I had anticipated, but I was, was not very happy with the lifestyle yeah. and, and kind of got to a point where I just, you know, it was, I didn't want to do it anymore. So it was, it was, we could move back to Utah. I have clients there. I know I can do this job there or I can change careers, but I'm not interested in, in what's going on anymore. Right. Gotcha. Um, now, so yeah, so that's, now, then we came back. No, I know you talked earlier. So you were, you were in LA doing really well, but you, I think you said you realized you could come to Utah and do the same thing here. You had enough, you worked enough studios here, basically, that you could have some clients. And I had, people. yeah, I had yeah. clients and friends, and um, I knew that the lifestyle was better. There's not quite the same pressure, right. and yeah. um, although I mean, right now I'm working <laughs> those are twelve hour days, but I do feel a little more in control. Like if I if something comes up with the kids or there's some reason to not work, right. no one's gonna fire me, which. Yep happened in LA you know like I got like off of projects because I had a family reunion and things like that so because you own your own yeah so is that more stressful what working for someone else or owning your own I found working for somebody else much more stressful in in my experience in LA was that there's there's for because we were working on projects with budgets that were four or five hundred thousand dollars 
there was no, there didn't seem to be a lot of drive. So we'd right. like hang out a lot. Like gotcha. you'd spend six hours a day doing nothing. <laughs> and then you'd work till two in the morning. And that drove me when pretty crazy. Happens, I just felt yeah. like we could get this wrapped yeah. up, you know, and yeah. that wasn't, it just didn't work for me. That gotcha. kind of waste in a sense. Yeah. Um, now I talked we talked earlier, you've worked with neon trees. Um, you were dropping some cool names like Snoop Dogg. I did work with, <laughs> that was a very random um, thing. I did work Tracy with Tracy Chapman. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know that there's just a lot of, uh, pretty up and coming people around Provo that have. Sure. Yeah. I've worked, I mean, you know, since we've been back, we've worked with a lot of the, um, local bands and local artists and I do a lot of Deseret book albums. We do a lot for BYU TV. Yeah, music for BYU TV. Now, did, so. it, did it kind of just or just me? Did it kind of seem for a while that there was a lot of bands that were kind of um, making it out of Provo? It wasn't um, Imagine Dragons? Yeah, kind sure. Of Imagine Dragons yeah. and Neon Trees. Fictionist got signed to Atlantic. Did they? Okay. Mod and the Flame got signed to Electra. Yeah. Um, and these are all bands you've produced and worked with. Worked with, yeah. Worked certainly, with. yeah. yeah. Well, Imagine Dragons early on, but uh, but. Neon Trees I worked with a lot, yeah. and Mod in the Flame, and Fictionist for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, there were, there are still lots of bands up and coming and, and making their way out. Um, I, that, I mean, I'm happy if we can be something that helps them. I wouldn't take credit for any of those bands. Like, yeah. that, you yeah. know, like, it's kinda, because of us. Yeah, no, <laughs> you know? no, you, you just happen to be here. Yeah, we're here, yeah. and yeah. hopefully we cool provide though. a way for them to make a great recording back yeah you know. yeah so um i wanted to talk about we talked earlier we talked earlier because we weren't recording earlier yeah, it's a recording it's a recording thing <laughs> my <but>. profession was <laughs> not yours. um but i wanted to ask you about this console because this is kind of like when i was on the on your website this is kind of what stuck out to me oh sure yeah i like console. having a console i don't yeah. like doing I don't like working in Pro Tools like for headphone Q sends and stuff. So yeah. like a lot of that busing and stuff like I really like doing on the console. Um, this is a day king. I think he calls it three one one two or I mean, he has a funny name for it. They're very handmade. Yeah. They, he didn't make a lot of them. He's making more now, but um, they're you know like you pull the channel strips out and it's like marker written in there. You know oh, like wow. I mean it's it's not it yeah like it's, it's yeah. pretty hand hand done. Um, What's his name? Jeff. Jeff Dakin. Jeff Dakin. Yeah. yeah, and so the channels themselves, if you remove the busing and the solo mutes and the things that make it console, are his same Mike Breen EQ. Awesome. Um, and so we have 32 of them, and then we have a center section. Even the center section is like an actual separate company that he just kind of yeah. retrofits into his board. Cool. Um, I We had an SSL in here when I first moved back, and they had this studio. Um, it was a big SSL. It was a mixing board. I don't particularly love SSLs yeah. as a front end, so it was impressive, but we never used it for anything more than like putting the keyboard on and, and summing. And it was hot and probably it, used a lot of power. And yeah, and I started getting <laughs> I started getting pretty worried about the fact that in an SSL there's so much logic switching and stuff that they're complicated boards. Right. There's not a, there's not anyone around here that I know of that's an SSL tech. And I just started looking at it like if this thing starts going wrong. I'm not going to be able to fix this yeah. thing, and it, and well, I'm not even using it. Like I'd have to ship it off somewhere. Or, yeah, I didn't. Or hire I didn't someone to come in and do right. it. Right. I yeah. I didn't want to have like o overhead on a console that I didn't even really particularly right. like. Yeah. It, if we were mixing that way, it would be awesome. Yeah. But we mix in Pro Tools, yeah. you know. So this is a better front end board. This board was bought from the I can't remember his name, but I found it on Gear Slots, and he's the guy that did like Christina Aguilera's first couple records and some Michael Jackson stuff. Yeah. And, so I went to his studio and picked it up. Cool. It's very simple. I, I yeah. can work on it. It's it, I can call Jeff and get him. To, you know, it, it's yeah. on the on the bottom he's such of it. Yeah. Small company. Yeah. He's just like, yeah. On the yeah. bottom of it is XLR and TRS, cool. and they just go to a patch bay. It, it's an easy board, and now, I think it sounds great. So. Yeah. Now you said you were you would record through it and you use the EQ, but mostly you're just summing this, like stereo a, channels through it, right? It's a thirty-two, so that side's. We use as mic pre's, yeah. 16 mic pre's and EQ's. This side we use for summing. Yeah. And we just send Pro Tools out in stereo pairs and sum through it and cool. then go back into Pro Tools for printing mixes. That's awesome. Um, now, monitors. I see some S uh, NS10's up there. Is that I right? love NS10 still. I yeah. use the NS10s a lot. So they um, have uh, they put atoms in the walls. Yeah. Um, I didn't buy the atoms. They were bought while we were in LA. Um, I don't have any. I don't like them, yeah. but I 
I also think it might be a function of the room. Like, I think they're probably great speakers. Yeah. They don't sound great in this room. They sound loud, and yeah. they have lots of whatever loud speakers so they have, were, so they're so great to turn it out. when you took this over, the yeah. speakers. Yeah. yeah. Now, these uh, barefoot. The barefoots I love. Yeah. Barefoots I'm very, like, I was, when I came, to, when I went to LA, I was using Dynaudio BM15s, and everybody there was using Proact 100s. Yeah. So I got really used to Proact, so then I moved to Proax. And I would blow drivers in them a lot and stuff. But <laughs> I had pro acts. I was using them, and I really liked them. Yeah. When we moved back and I moved into this room, I had a hard time with the pro acts. For whatever reason, they weren't working mm. the way they did in L.A. in those rooms. Yeah. And so I was. there was a lot of that kind of thing where you mix and you go out and you get surprised. So did the guy that uh, took over Gene Audio from you, did he design these rooms? He didn't there. design them. These were designed by an uh, actual studio designer from yeah. LA um, and who's done a number of studios around here. Yeah. I can't say like he's my favorite studio designer. I don't really particularly love the rooms. Now the, one, now the studio you're moving into in August. The studio that we're building will you, be with Westless Show. Are you helping design some of that? Or well, it kinda... I'm helping design it in telling Wes what yeah. I'd like it to be and then he designs it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I went back east he, he's from North Carolina. Most of his studios tend to be on the East Coast. So I went back east and toured a bunch of his studios after reading everything I could online about him. Cool. And his rooms sound fantastic. Just yeah. unbelievable. So what is it about so, his rooms that you want? Uh, that you they're, they're, they feel better to be in. Okay. They, um, he, the way he, the way you've never heard, I've never heard speakers that sound, he uses, he, he does a different thing with the in-wall monitors, the soffit monitors. Um, they're ear level, so they're lower. Gotcha. And um, they just sounded... In most of the case, people that worked in those rooms didn't use near fields. They just right. used the soffit monitors. And the rooms just sound awesome. So I'm interested. Um, what monitors are you on most of the time? The barefoots. Are you? Mm -hmm. yeah. These are generation kind of ones. Um, the Generation 2, I'm sure, is even better, uh, but these still work amazing for me. I started reading about these, yeah. people talking about, oh, man, they're so amazing. So then I demoed them in L.A., and when I started working on them, it changed. It really did change um, everything about how I work. I mean, yeah. I don't, I, I can send, I have no problem sending a mix when I'm done with it in here. I, I used to be like, just from those. I got to check it in the car, I got to check it at home. Yeah. I don't even do that anymore. I, and if, if I'm struggling with anything or having a hard time, I'll go listen to the other room or I'll put on headphones. But most of the time, I can dial it in on the barefoots and say it's done and I don't worry about it. And I never had that experience before that. I was always surprised yeah. in one way or another. Now that, might be that Barefoot makes the greatest monitors in the world, <laughs> and it might be that they work great with my ears, yeah. because there's people who will use Atoms and say they're the, they're the best, they're the best yeah. and they don't work for me. So I don't know, you know. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it, I think it's so personal, um, but I will say that if these have a problem, I would just, I would sell any piece of gear in here to and buy them again. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, gotcha. They, I'd rather have those than anything else. Yeah. But you still have the NS10s. I noticed a lot of studios. I love NS10s. Yeah, a lot of the studios, guys can't let those go. They just yeah. always have them. And they're kind of scary. They kind of can be a bit scary monitors because, like, they don't make them anymore. Yeah. And if you blow stuff. I have another pair at home. Yeah. In case. You hide them but some of, somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> but some of, the, some of the guys I worked with in L.A. only used NS10s, yeah. which I don't know how you do that either. Yeah. But, yeah, I, I love them. And I know Yamaha's making a lot of other uh, new monitors yeah. that look like NS10s. They look like NS10s, but they don't sound like NS10s. But, uh, I mean, NS10s sound... But the guys are using them, and they like them, so... Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, speakers, you get used yeah. to them, you know? Yeah. It's whatever you're using. Uh, NS10s sound terrible. I don't think they sound <laughs> awesome. Yeah. But they sound terrible in a way that really helps me. Yeah. They, For me, they're a good thing for checking vocal levels and checking to make sure that right. the bass is sitting right. Because if I can hear it on the NS10s, quiet then I'm usually you know good. good. But sometimes you can hear it so well on like the Adams or the Barefoots, but it's non-existent on the NS10s. Then you got to bring out some harmonic content and try to get the sit in small monitors. And I was looking at this rack and I, it's right here. So I'm, I'm guessing this is your go-to no, outboard I wouldn't, stuff. I wouldn't say necessarily. Okay. okay, so this rack, when I sold the studio, I moved to, um, and and when I sold Junai the first time I moved to LA, right. I took with me some of this gear and bought some of this gear with the money that we made. So I bought a, a, a pair of dressers, I bought these Chandler LTD ones, gotcha. and some of the germanium stuff, and the TG1 
And then while I was in LA, I bought some of this other stuff. So it just kind of ended up in this rack. And before we owned this space and owned all the rest of this gear and bought it all back, that was my rack that I'd roll back and forth. Cool. So yeah. it just it has stayed that way. I, yeah. I would prefer that all this stuff just be so in the gym. So did you have this one over in the other room mm -hmm. before you move yeah. over? Yeah. So now that's what I would just roll around. It's changed a little bit. There's some mic pre's in there that I I swap things out. Yeah. So I'm looking in there. I don't really. I'm not really that familiar with the Mag Audio stuff. Is it? So is Ma, it just, Cliff Mog. Cliff yeah. Mog is from Provo. Yeah. Lives in Provo. Okay. And um, these are the EQ2. He actually kind of, they were nice enough to kind of come down and have me help, not help, but I mean, I, they asked me questions, you know, like, what do, you, what do you think about these EQ points and what should we do? So like, there's a, yeah. there's an EQ point way up at 1.4K in the low frequencies that I kind of said, well, I use that a lot. That'd be awesome if we could get something up there. And so he kind of designed these. I mean, based on some stuff you uh, said to him. Very little. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm not taking any credit that's, for the that's design. Cool. But it was cool to get to like have yeah. a, a few comments in there, and and then I got a free pair of EQ too. Yeah. So that was awesome too. Yeah. Um, I here. I love those. <laughs> those are on my stereo. Like we've got a man, manly massive passive that I used to yeah. use on the stereo bus all the time. Yeah. And now I just use those EQ too. So my stereo bus goes through this smart. C1 compressor. It's this black guy here. That this and one that's right, this one right here. That's essentially an SSL yeah, quad compressor. Like an SSL, yeah. Um, and then I use those Mog EQs. That's my stereo bus stuff that is out of the box. Cool. Um, so you, so you just you're running stuff uh, right out of Pro Tools through this EQ. Yeah, I run. The I run the, the mix bus gets sung through the board, then and then goes this. through there, and then goes back into okay. Pro Tools for printing. Cool. Um, the other, I mean, the other things in here like. I use I use most of this stuff on every session. The germanium stuff is a little more finicky, so I don't use that as much. The Chandler germanium stuff, but yeah. like the La Chapelle five eighty three pre and the Autac pre, I use those constantly. Cool. Um, What's this? Uh, I don't, I'm, I'm that's the that's this. old school audio. I think they're even out of business now. Oh really? But they made like some API kind of knockoff stuff. Okay. And that one was like an API 512 with a really huge transformer and bigger low end. So it's like what I use for kick drum, the inner kick drum mic cool. all the time. What about this piece right here? The purple? The funny thing about the purple, I think I've heard of purple is before. like, yeah, and I used to really love that preamp. And there's no reason I don't love it other than I just don't really use it very much anymore. Right. But I remember it being really good, but I haven't used it in, a, in quite a while. I used the, the little... Um, a Designs P1 over there. there. That's it's it's fairly kind of mid range focused, and I use I love it on snare and electric guitars and stuff. And then what do we have? Um, Those down okay, here. so these are called what are, yeah, bit, yeah, yeah. what are they? Yeah, yeah. What are they called? <laughs> They're industrial research projects. Yeah. Voice Maddox. If you guys are living in Utah, you will find these in pawn shops. Really? They're they're I need to look for some. They're four to one um, mixers that were used in church. For church podium mics really like so you'd have the podium mic and then you know there's some xlr jacks around the chapel yeah. and they'd all go into that and then give you one output but, it's a, but they just have like a total annihilation compressor limiter on yeah. the back end nice. so i found i mean I, I think these were like 10 bucks each i think i found four of them and gave some to mike green and you, um, you guys are the guys that find this stuff. so <laughs> so if you if you find these they're, what they're so great for is like um like a like an under snare mic or a crotch mic on like drums. Cool. And we just mash the crap just out of it, you know? It, I mean, it completely annihilates yeah. it, like to distortion levels. Oh, yeah. But it's very cool for that. If you put it. And they're so cheap. Enough. It's like yeah. a level lock, really. And, and level locks have now gotten ridiculously expensive. And so that's another option. Cool. But yeah, I mean, that's awesome that you found those for ten. We used it yesterday. Oh, they're awesome. <laughs> we put a, we put like a coals out in front of the kit, and we ran it through yesterday. I may have to pick your brain later. It's great. It just, <laughs> it just destroys. Stuff. And then what do we got up here on the top? Well, these these I got from some guy in Salt Lake. They're Trident EQs, but they don't work. I got them as part of like oh. this package deal, and they have a million capacitors in them, and they all have gone bad it needs to be recapped and i'm not sure they're worth they look like an adb but it's not the same circuit as an adb gotcha. i'm not even sure they're worth like fixing up <laughs> so <laughs> they're cool they, they look cool <laughs> they're just sitting there and then this is this is my friend sam carden's studio electronics and it's basically like the guy was taking was making a mini moog in a rack mountable yeah. version back yeah. when in the 80s it looks like so yeah, that's that's like what one. it is it's just the same <laughs> yeah it's a rack now. so this big rack here so the credenza that they built here um it's not particularly big i would prefer to have all this gear in here but it's not big enough 
Um, we use all this stuff all the time. So um, you've got, you know, some knee freeze that were re re racked by Brent Averill, um, some API stuff. Isn't here, yeah. 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 I don't really, I, we use the Avalon sometimes. I saw that in your studio tour and I wondered, because those were the big thing. They were the big thing. The and I used to have, I used to have two of them and I sold one because I, I don't particularly love them, yeah. but it's very convenient because it's a channel strip. So yeah. I'll throw stuff, you know, scratch vocals and, I really seem to like it on Wurlitzer or Rhodes, so I use it for that. So but there's I don't, specific things you like it on. It's yeah. I think wasn't it, I don't know. Wasn't, for it, me, wasn't it a go-to channel strip for vocals back in the day? Oh yeah, I mean people yeah. really like them yeah. still. Yeah. I don't. I'm not sure I know why they don't. They're not great they for me. For you. Yeah. I mean they're shiny. Maybe that's <laughs> why. But like I, I think they're just a little boring sounding. Uh, cool. Uh, the API stuff we use a ton, and then you can see there's a couple more of those Mog Pre's in there. Yeah. And then lots of EQs on the bottom, and those yeah. two red All guys the five, down there are... The 550Bs, yeah. Yeah, lots of 550s. Um, what are you mostly using? Uh, drums. Just drums, okay. Yeah, you can gotcha. see even what label, that's almost what yeah. lives in there. The, the yeah. outside kick mic, the bottom snare. Did I ask snare. you about these? Those are, so those are Brent Averill's. Oh, yeah. They're actually... Um, they were now he remakes them, but those ones are from an actual vintage API console that he re racked. Oh, cool. Um, now he's kind of run out of old consoles, so now he just recreates them. But I don't know if there's any sonic difference, yeah. Those are just older, so and these are the mag audios again. Yeah, uh, cool. those are their pre's, cool. and they have their airband EQ and built in. So we've been using those on overheads, which is really nice. It lifts them, they're, they're fairly clean. I wouldn't put them in like the Neve API camp. Yeah. Um, but they're great on overheads. Um, I haven't used them a lot for vocals, although I know guys like them for vocals, but we haven't had them very long. Um, this is another one of his EQs. This is an older one. Before it was called Mog Audio, it was called Night Pro. And now, then... Now, have you heard of the BAE stuff? Yeah, that, a lot of... The, I mean, this is that's what this stuff is. that was based Bren on? Bren Averill... Well, I mean, Bren Averill... This is all the BAE See, stuff. what happened is they changed from Bren Averill Enterprises to, Bre to BAE. BAE, okay. And I that's think I that's happened when Brent died. Okay. But it's the same stuff. Well, what you yeah, can see is stuff. like this is made from a Neve 1272 module. Right. This is when he was taking old consoles and pulling them apart and pulling the actual parts out. Cool. Now he remakes it because kind of ran out of consoles or at yeah. least it became too expensive. So it's the same circuit and everything as far as I understand. But um, he makes he makes them new, you know. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, he makes ones with EQs and, and filters. What you, and now, what are you mostly using this for? Uh, I use them for vocals, cool. electric guitars. They sound cool when you push them. It's like a guitar amp, right? Like, yeah. if you're playing guitar yeah. and you turn it up a certain amount, you'll get a certain amount of sustain and stuff. But if you turn it up a little sure. more, suddenly you're getting more sustain and you're getting more harmonics. And so there's that sweet spot. It's the same with preamps. Like, if you keep the preamp really low and the, the output all the way up, if there is, like, there is on right. those, mm -hmm. um, then it's going to sound one way. But if you start driving a little bit, it's a whole different sound. So there's kind of a sweet spot in those. I don't tend to keep the outputs like way, way, way low right. um, because they do get pretty saturated. Yeah. Um, but I'll, I'll certainly trim the output and, and crank it a little bit more if that's the sound. So these are 20, need 2074s. This is the EQ section of a 1073 without the preamp. Gotcha. Um, we use those a lot for vocals and really anything and the manly massive passive is a 2 bq I, I don't i don't use it as much as i used to anymore it's a very sweet eq i it, it seems silly not to use it but i i just don't uh, it's maybe maybe it's a little too sweet for me i like yeah. stuff that tends to be more aggressive but right. um the 160 vus i use all the time for kick and snare they're also really great on bass and guitar they're really grabby you know and they have a i think they're really awesome and then the Spectrosonic 610 is really interesting. They're a company out of Ogden. For a while, I would find so many of these in studios around when I was living in LA, and guys wanted them in LA that I would I'd buy them here and take them wow. to LA and sell them to other engineers. That's cool. I wish I had another one. Um, they're just awesomely aggressive, and it could even be that something's broken with mine, but it yeah. distorts in a really cool way. So I feel like I'm keeping this one. I, I use it. I use it for really aggressive sounds cool. um, what else like this is a um, Kush Audio uh, they call it I think they call it UBK Fatso it's like they took the they took the Empirical Labs Fatso and they re they changed some things in the circuit and then they put a new faceplate on it so yeah. I had a Fatso that we didn't use all that much and I sent it to him and now I use this all the time 
I like it a lot more. It's more usable. It's one of those compressors that like every setting is good and works for something. Yeah. And then another pair of distressors. Oh, yeah. How many of those you got? That's four. four so okay. it, I mean, those are the. If anybody says which compressors did I get, I said get distressor. Distressor. Yeah. It just does everything. Everything. Yeah. I use it on vocals and bass and guitars that. and kick and snare and strings and I use it for anything. And then what are these red? Uh, so these are Mohawk Audio um, Fat 76s, I think he okay. calls them. Yeah. Like, they're basically an 1176, 76, obviously. Yeah. The funny thing is, I had two original 1176s, the blackface ones. I saw that, those when I was doing your tour. Yeah, yeah they were like the ones that everybody yeah. wants, and I didn't yeah. like them. Yeah. And then I had them recapped, because I thought, maybe they need to be recapped. And I still didn't like them. But they're really valuable, Yeah. so I sold them, and for the two of those, I came away with cash, and or for... Like one of them, I had cash left over and bought both of these. Those sound great. And you know the other one I sold and just made money on, and I bought this. So I love eleven seventy sixes. I didn't love those two. I don't know why. Yeah. I don't know. I just didn't like them. I love these. I use these all the time. And I love this three A that he makes because yeah. I love LA three A's, but can't afford real LA three A's. And so <laughs> what? So yeah, he makes these. They're wood faces. And you can choose which color. Oh, really? So yeah, that's what's that kind of so cool. Kind of different about them. Wow. Um, so then you got the classic uh, one. I have a one sixty five, and then two one sixty five. I don't. I don't think I've used this one sixty five in ages. Really? I don't know why. I should start using it more. I mean, I know why. I have a lot of compressors, and so things get chosen before it. But it, there's nothing particularly wrong with it. I just haven't used it in a long time. And then the one sixties get used when we have a huge yeah. session and we need some overflow. And then what's this big beast the right here? Level? Yeah, the state that, level. The yeah. state level I use on vocals almost like, you know, at least half the sessions go through the state level. I love it. I, and it's big and tubby sounding and thick. That's and what the, I love what, it on bass. That's what they model all the vintage plugins after. That's right. <laughs> I mean, I think, it's, I think it's awesome, but I think I use it more than other people. I think other people maybe think of them as being more of a unique like a specialty thing and i use it all the time cool for whatever reason it works good for me as you can see uh scott's got the uber collection of everything <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's just talk about some of the keys that you got real quick sure what's your favorite what do you use the most uh well we certainly use the d3 quite yeah, a bit yeah, yeah. um uh, let's see. I mean, I use I use the Wurlitzer. This is a Whirly one forty five yeah. or one forty. Can't remember. Um, it's the tube one, whatever that is. Yeah. And I use that a lot more than the Rhodes, although we use the Rhodes a fair amount. That's an awesome Rhodes, um, man. Re the interesting thing is that Rhodes um, samples are so good that we use samples a lot too. Cool. We we'll use like a, a fake Rhodes maybe more even than this. Really? <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's you know it's depends easy. on who it is. It's yeah. easy. Yeah. Um, this is a little field pump organ. It gets used a fair amount, and then that's a little celeste back there. That's cool. Um, we obviously lately just because of the way music has been, we use a lot of synths. So um, we use the Prophet and the Juno. And yeah. The, um, Do you like the way music's been going? Or well, would you it, go I, I, I would probably traditional? I'd probably say for my taste, it's not quite as I mean. Yeah. Five or six years ago, we were doing a lot more stuff that like I maybe. I don't know if it's like anymore, but I, what I like is I like engineering real instruments and yeah. people playing together. Mm -hmm. And now it's much more piecemeal. Yeah, um, it's a whole different thing, and and I enjoy it, but it just feels different. Yeah, you know. Let's talk about now. How long have you been collecting? Like, what's the oldest guitar here that you have? Um, well, I have the guitar I've had the longest is probably one of the Rickenbackers because I got it in high school. Gotcha. Um, the oldest guitar would be, I mean, somewhere there's a. 54 Gibson <laughs> somewhere and somewhere oh this so this Gibson yeah. this is a 54 J45 oh, and gotcha. um, we have some older guitars we have lots of guitars that are old um, but they're not the one I've had the, the longest is one of the Ricks that I got in high school yeah. cool yeah I mean there's I mean we could spend just yeah, there's a lot Days of guitars <laughs> there's a lot of guitars because I'm a guitar player so I, I tend to um, uh from working in LA, especially, um, or in other in you know other parts of the country, I found that producers generally came with like a toolkit of their the things that made sounds that they liked, right. and I saw a lot of. I, I just realized that I kind of um, when I was first engineering, I thought the most important thing is EQ. Right. You know, like if it doesn't sound right, EQ it. 
And then I realized that the guys who were really good engineers, most of the time what they were changing was the instrument or the amp. And then secondly, maybe we changed the mic or the placement and then yeah. EQ kind of came last. So as far as the guitar collection goes or, or any of the instruments, if, it, if I end up with something with a There's similar some voice. There's stuff in here. Yeah. The harmony. Yeah, a lot of these guitars over here, these are not expensive guitars. No, yeah. I mean, these are guitars that were sold at Sears. Yeah, this and was my first, uh, it was a Strat Harmony was my first guitar. I yeah, so I mean, one. this yeah. these this Harmony just got used the other day. Yeah. These these gold foil pickups are amazing sounding. I wouldn't necessarily want to play one live <laughs> because they don't stay in tune yeah, great. Sounds, and, yeah. But they sound, in the studio, they sound amazing. So all these guitars are like cheaper yeah. guitars. I'd rather have these than some real fancy Les Paul yeah. that just sounds yeah. Not everybody has like this old harmony head that has this like really weird funky thing to it. And I mean, I'm just looking for colors that people, I just, it's so much easier to switch out a guitar than it is to try to EQ it something into a track. Now, I noticed you have a very eclectic uh, collection of amplifiers, um, yeah. and um, I don't and see a lot of KSL finds, and I don't see any Marshall or anything like that in there, there's though. One Marshall is there really? Oh, there. Oh, okay. And <laughs> there's not. There's lots of old Fenders. I don't do a ton of like, like I, I don't, I don't really want to hear like Mesa Boogie overdriven sounds and stuff. Yeah, so yeah, like, yeah, yeah. it's not, it's not my style. Like, yeah. so we do a lot of drivey stuff, but it tends to be out of one of these amps or with pedals or something. I don't know, like, I just never, I guess personally I don't really, I'd love to have a vintage like Plexi or something, Yeah. but yeah. any of the modern gang stuff, like I just don't really much. care for yeah. it. I just, it doesn't sit in a track well. Like, I mean, honestly, like if I need a heavy sounding guitar, this like little Supra 110, this little Trojan, that thing mic'd up sounds like enormous. Really? And then you get a Mesa cool. that's, you know, got 120 dB out here, and it doesn't fit in a track well for me for whatever reason. But I'm not. I'm also not recording those kind of bands. Now, yeah. Now, when you're um, when you're micing up an app, are you 57 uh, little mics? I'm almost always a 57 and an AEA R84. Okay. Together. In fact, I think we have some amps in there mic'd up. Okay. Like, it's almost always those in, two mics in, in here. Some together. Yeah. Let's see. Somebody, somebody might have moved the mics. Oh yeah. No 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 no. They're right there. Cool. Yeah, so I mean, this is not how they sit. But yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm almost always like an R84 like that and a 57 like that with the diaphragms basically lined up and probably about that far away. Sometimes way farther away, sometimes a little bit closer. But you can see like, just as far as being eclectic, like this was a session the, the, we did the other day and we chose this old Ampeg with a 15 inch uh, speaker and that old Magnetone. Yeah. Both of these amps are not amps that anybody would I mean, these they, are not like what they, you normally they wouldn't see think. as collectible yeah. amps. Like yeah. these aren't, but these two amps have such unique voices and sound so amazing. I mean, this old Magnetone especially, like, you know, on, on a lot of the fictionist stuff, like Robbie loves this amp. Mm -hmm. I love this amp. He sounds great playing through it. So like we use it all the time, but like that is not a normal amp that you see anytime. It certainly wasn't an expensive amp, but it sounds awesome. Yeah, and we have some expensive amps, and we still use that all the time. Cool, <laughs> you know. So. Yeah, it just matters what sounds the best. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, whatever and whatever you're looking for. Yeah, the sound you're looking for. Wow, amazing, man! Amazing collection. And also, he's Scott's got a. Let's see. Let me just get a yeah. bit of video of this room. Right here. We've got a upright piano in here, and a and a grand. I find the upright and the. This is a Yamaha C7 Grand. Yeah. I find, and then the upright's an old Bush and Gertz, like a late 1800s. I, they're two different instruments to me. Um, they just sound so different in a track that, like, it's either one or the other. It's not necessarily like, right. oh, we just want to have two pianos. It's like a really different instrument. So um, we tend to use them very differently. We tend to keep the Bush and the, the upright. Um, a little bit out of tune. We tack, we put tacks on it a lot of times to make it sound. Make cool. it sound cool, yeah. Yeah, so we mess with. Well, them. and you know, these days everyone's doing samples that all sound the same. So if you can record a real piano and that's yours, yeah, that's I, unique. I, it's very rare that I found a piano sample to me that I would rather use. There's lots of yeah. things that I'm I'm happy to. We have a million guitar amps, and I'm happy to do a DI guitar with guitar rig or some plugin on there. Piano, I can't. 
I don't know. It just doesn't sit in the track the same. Like, a real piano will tend to get out of the way. Like, you can hear it, but it's still not blanketing the track and being in the way. And I can just, I can mic it in mono, or I can, I mean, I, a lot of times, like, we'll put this grand on the small stick and just put a mic out here and one over there in weird ways. But, like, sonically, I just can't recreate it with samples. Piano, I don't know what it is. There's much just be how complex the harmonics are in the piano, yeah. but... I haven't heard a sample that usually will pull it off. For cool. Me. All right, so Scott's got this all set up because he's working on a, a session right now. But what can you tell me um, about what mics you're using and shit sure. and that kind of thing? Well, we're working on an album right now, and um, I'm doing the track, so I'm bringing in a drummer. This is Aaron Anderson set up. He's left-handed, so he plays backwards. Um, so we're just leaving drums set up all the time. And obviously we're out in the bigger room. Sometimes we'll do things in the booth, but we're out in the bigger room, but then we wanted to tighten things up. So hence all the blankets and the big foam gogos and stuff. Um, the, the things that I find interesting is we'll swap out kick drums and snare drums and toms all the time and cymbals. Like we swap things out a lot. Um, it's pretty rare that from one song to the next, they have to stay or should stay the same. Um, so we have a ton of drums too. I don't play drums, but I, it's way easier for me to swap out this kick drum for that little 20 inch Rogers than to try to EQ this to sound like a 20 inch Rogers. It just doesn't work. So, so, this, are, so are these your... These are all these my are drums. drums. I think some of these are Aaron cymbals. In fact, all of these are Aaron cymbals. I'm probably going to embarrass but these myself. These are my drums. I might embarrass This is left handed though. I don't yeah. know how to do this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the interesting thing about the way Aaron plays is he doesn't ever cross his arms. Yeah. So he'll play his hi hat like with this. his right, and then when yeah. he switches to ride, he plays the snare with the other hand. And so what do we got? What are you doing on overheads here? Those are blue kiwis. Yeah. I've always really liked those on overheads. I haven't used them in a long time, so we just kind of pulled them out. But they're they're kind of pre EQ'd. You know, they're fairly bright and um, sparkly. But I think they're great overhead mics, and they're good on piano and stuff. I don't love them on vocals. I think they're too strident for vocals, but so we we switch out overheads a lot. With the rest of the mics tend to stay the same, but I'll do those or U sixty sevens, Coles, Sony C thirty sevens. We switch out overheads a lot. Um, the rest of the mics we keep. I about the same. you've got this mic that's kind of sitting. In between. Yeah, the four twenty one. Yeah, yeah. So we call that the crotch mic. <laughs> that's something I picked up from Chad Blake. Uh, it was an engineer I worked with in L A. Yeah. And that mic just gets, that's the mic that gets hammered through compression. And does it just and pick up everything? It down picks there? up everything. It picks up a lot of the ghost stuff on the snare oh, gotcha. and yeah. that backside of the kick drum that's kind of slappy. Yeah. And so you just add a little bit, you just store, usually compress it and distort it and then add a tiny bit of it. The same thing with this coals that's sitting out front. Yeah, yeah no, that's That mic gets moved around a little bit, but it's another one of those ones that gets compressed a lot. And now, are you. Uh, so I'm making top and bottom of the snare with 57s. Do you mic the hi-hat? I don't mic the hi-hat. I always want to turn down the hi-hat, and so I, I never, don't mic them either. I never mic the hi-hat. <laughs> there's a couple drummers who will come in, and if it's like an R&B kind of thing, or like something where there's going to be really intricate hi-hat work, yeah. then maybe I will throw a mic on there. Or if the drummer requests it, I don't have a problem with it. But I've never wanted to do anything but turn hi-hat down, so I don't even bother my YouTube. Um, <laughs> So, the, so top and bottom is there with 57s, another thing I picked up from another engineer and it's kind of weird, but I don't use any condensers on snares, I just, that's what I use. Yeah. Um, I love these Audio Technica ATM 25s that they don't make anymore, but I'm hoarding them because I love them on toms <laughs> and so I have a bunch of them. Now I was listening to um, some Fictionist tracks uh -huh. that you did on the way down in uh -huh. my car, uh -huh. <laughs> and I noticed your drums they're, the snares always get this really thick, but clean but dirty sound. All does that make sense? Yeah. What I'm yeah. saying. Wait, what were you listening to? Um, so I just got on Spotify. Okay. And I pulled up Fictionists. The new, I mean, the newest record they did, they recorded drums at home on oh, everything they? except for one track, and and when I when they brought it into mix. Well, I was also listening to stuff on your website too. Okay, the stuff on my website would have been here. Yeah, yeah. Um, the. That stuff that they recorded at home was I, my hands were tied a little bit because they didn't mic it conventionally, so there was a lot of like a mic way out here, yeah. and so so it tends to be kind of mid rangey and forward and distorted. But 
I wouldn't have mic'd it that way, and I'm glad that they did it because it ended up being a really unique sound that I wouldn't have got, you know? Yeah. Okay, so, I mean, you know, drums are drums. You're, you're only going to be able to... You're only going to be able to make them sound as good as they sound in here and as good as the guy, the tones the guy gets out of them. Like, right. I, I used to stress out because I'd get great drum sounds one week and then bad drum sounds. I couldn't figure out what am I doing wrong. And I finally realized once I knew like how to get phases and stuff set up that it really was just if the guy wasn't a good drummer, then it was just. There's nothing you can Sorry, do. Sorry, dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Phase um, doesn't matter with you, buddy. Yeah. But I will say that like. We use a we use a lot of snares. You can see from this session yesterday how many snares there are. There's what seven snares in here, and we change them up all the time, and we keep them tuned different, and they have different heads, and they're all. I, and I've got another twenty snares in there. Yeah, I'm like so, looking back here too at all yeah, your toms. All other sounds. <laughs> yeah. So like we we switch out drums a lot. Yeah. Um, rather than like because again like a, a twenty eight inch kick drum is going to just sound way different than a twenty. And there's no way to get from there to the other place with some sort of modeler thing. At least there's not an easy way. Right. So I don't bother with it. I just buy, a, you know, I go on KSL and I buy a 28 inch kick for a hundred bucks and now it works. But this kind of stuff, like we've got tons of these kind of things. Like we've got the, we've got rings, we've got the big fat snare, whatever this thing is called. Um, I don't know if you've heard these, but they're kind of amazing. Like, wow. listen to, uh, where's this? I mean, I've seen those thinner rings, but I haven't seen the big fat ones. This one's amazing. This is my new favorite thing. So if you listen. And I noticed you have uh, some really high, high end duct tape on there too. Oh yeah, there's always tape <laughs> on here. There's yeah, put tape. that back on again. That was cool. Yeah, so I mean, like, well. Maybe that's kind of. Listen on this one. Okay. Like, okay. And then you take this thing. It drops the pitch, tightens it up. Yeah. So like I use this kind of stuff. I think that's maybe what I'm hearing on some of the tracks that yeah. you recorded. Yeah, I use yeah. that stuff all the time. I use the snare way. I don't know if you if you know about snare way, but like this is, the snare way is a little thing that these leather things fasten into. Oh no! And so and then it, it um, has a magnet it mounts so on it, there. It goes up against it. Okay. And it's like so it'll get rid of rings. What are those? What are those run? These are like 40 bucks or something. On Amazon like, or? Uh, maybe, but I just bought them from snareweight.com. Oh, did you? Okay. And then they send you a bunch of these little leather inserts so you can go, um, you can go kind of, you can put thicker ones, thinner ones. There's some that are like this that wrap around the drum and get it really dead. And I mean, this kind of stuff we use more than anything. Like That's cool. We even have, um, we'll take old bottom snare heads, the really thin ones, and just cut out the circle, yeah. And then lay it on the drum. Wow. Okay. And, and so I've just got old a crappy head cloth that I got from a fabric store. Just different weights of cloth, and we'll just tape them on or drape them over and stuff like that. Like we do that all the time. So so it's a lot of like that's amazing messing with stuff rather than like I need to have eight Craviato snares. It's like well I have an Acrylite. Let's make that, it sound how we that want. I got from DI. <laughs> and we'll just put some fabric on it. And that, that doesn't, that's not to say it'll sound like a Craviato, but sometimes it's not, sometimes you want a sound that sounds kind of weird, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, so I have a lot of that kind of stuff. Like when these we are, do drums, I'll just bring out the box of fabrics and toys and... These are great tips. I, had, I hadn't heard of the, um, what do you call the little thing? The snare weight? From? Yeah, the snare yeah. weight. Yeah, that's cool. So the snare weight is awesome. Yeah. And really, the interesting thing is that as drummers come in and use it, it seems like almost always every drummer ends up buying one. So like I said, I'll probably end up I'll probably things. end up buying one. <laughs> yeah, I mean these magnet in. There's different thicknesses depending on how dead you want it. And then it has a magnet so it just locks against the head. Cool. And I find that it keeps the high end um, intact better than like moon gel or tape even though this drum has tape on it. Yeah. But um, it tends to it tends to just um, Get rid of the harmonics that you don't want, or the rings. I mean, this drum's out of tune a little bit. Yeah. I would say, like, we should tune this drum. But this also can sometimes help wow. yeah. tone it down. Man. So the, I'm a big advocate for the snare weight. I love them. Cool. I use them like crazy. There's a lot of bass drums. Like, it's the same thing. It's like... Um, I noticed you have that huge, what's that huge kick drum The drum cell one? Yeah, the drum yeah, cell one. Should we pull that out? Yeah, pull it out. Let's take a look at that. It's over here. That thing's cool. 
this is everyone just calls it the drum sale drum. Um, I went on a road trip with some friends of mine where we purposely just drove around for two weeks looking for gear. Yeah. And we ended up in a lot of pawn shops and um, like we went, what, we what went all the way go? out. We went all the way out to uh, what? Um, St. Louis, and then we went up to Chicago and back. Wow, from here? Yeah. Wow. We just drove in Fictionist cool. van. <laughs> so you, it was with the Fictionist? We're, we're, Robbie went with us. Cool. That's awesome. And this was hanging in a window in a, drums, in a music store in Nebraska to advertise the drum sale they were what having. Part, what part of Nebraska was that in? <sighs> My brother lives It was like a little home. town somewhere. Yeah. A little bit of those out there. So, so this is a Ludwig that's, a, I, gosh, it looks like it might be 12 or 14 by 28. And it was, it has these things on it. So it was a marching bass drum. Gotcha, yeah. Um, but I bought it because I just thought, well, that'd be cool. And then I just bought these legs that clamp on. Yep. But this drum gets used a ton. And in fact, really? Nate Pfeiffer, who I work with a lot, and I, we've made samples of it. And we use the samples a ton, too. I was going to ask you about Nate. Does he work here? Or does he run his own little... He has his own, team? like, Nate's a producer, like has a, his own studio at home. And just, gotcha. we work together a lot. So cool. We'll track drums, we'll track vocals, I'll mix stuff, and he does a lot of stuff at home, of course. But like, the weird, the interesting thing about it is, I find a lot of times with sounds, that it, sometimes it sounds bad by itself, and it sounds cool in a track. So if I was to like, to get know. this, you get a lot of that kind of concerty oh, bass yeah. drum sound that you think is bad, yeah. and you'd put, you'd put a 22 inch drum with this, you know, like a, um, the head that has the control on it, you tighten it all up and everything. It sounds like a studio drum, but sometimes like that weird slappy sound needs to be there to cut through the mix. And in the mix, it sounds normal. It doesn't sound all weird, but a lot of times drummers don't want to use this drum because the, when you sit and play it, it doesn't sound good. Weird. Yeah. But in a track, when it's just it killer. Cool. It's so great. So what, you have to have a track that's big enough to have it. Is there a song it. you can name that you've recorded that has this drum on it? Yeah, the, there's a band called the New Tarot. Okay. And if you listen to, man, what's that song called? <laughs> I don't, I'll have to find out. Okay. But we did a bunch of stuff with the New Tarot somewhat recently, and they have videos or SoundCloud or something up, and you can hear this drum, and it's awesome. Cool. I find that I like drums that are shallower and wider more than I like drums that are deep cannons that are like small. small. Yeah, okay. But between this drum and like that little 20 inch Rogers that I got at a garage sale, like that drum gets used all the time. This is from the 50s. Wow. And we use this drum on almost every session, every session almost. So yeah, I think the, it's interesting. The one thing I've learned today talking to you is that you're using just a lot of like old stuff that you found. Sure. And it sounds great for what you're doing. Yeah. And it, it's it not better, stuff, and maybe it sounds better than the stuff they advertise all the time. That's well, I mean, you know, it. like yeah. I, I'll go into Guitar Center, yeah. and it's impressive to see all the stuff, but like, there's hardly anything in there that I'd want to yeah. use. Yeah, that's not to say it sounds bad, but like, I don't want to spend, I want to spend two grand for a brand new DW no. set, no. and I can get a Rogers set for three hundred bucks at a garage sale <laughs> that will yeah. work awesome. Yes. This kick drum works like that thing looks bananas. Cool too. That thing is cool, and so. It's beat up. It's yeah. sound, I mean, this drum, every every drummer we put this in front of, especially guys who are like, I don't know about a 20 inch kick, when they hear it, they're totally solo. I mean, that's an unbelievable yeah. sounding drum. Cool. Um, Scott, thanks, man. Yeah, for that's showing right. me the studio. Um, just as a wrap up, what do you, what's some advice you'd give some just up and coming? Watch your Yeah, I'm gonna fall. Too much stuff in here. Um, <laughs> what up and coming producers that kind of want to get into this and don't quite know where to start. Oh yeah, good point. Uh, you know, the, the hardest, longest way to go is to start your own place and go that way. And just keep going. Um, yeah. I did that. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I'm not saying like it's a bad way to go, but, um, but I think it's really valuable to just go intern, assist, work for somebody else. And learn some stuff. And learn some stuff. Um, the the thing that I realized about my career is that I wanted to be a producer, was working towards being a producer, but I but I was thinking in the back of my mind, well, I have a business, so I need to grow the business, so the studio should get bigger and bigger. So the studio is now what you see, yeah. but because the studio is so big and so expensive, um, it's limited my 
producing abilities to where I can't really do things like, oh, I'll do it for practically free just because yeah. I like the music. And yeah. that was probably a little bit of a mistake. Yeah. Um, like, I probably would have been better off getting a great vocal mic and a great acoustic guitar mic and some synths and having a home studio and then going to a bigger studio like this to do yeah. the things that you need because you don't need this studio this big for everything. Yeah. What I'm trying to do now, since we're going to be building a bigger studio and here I am, I'm a studio owner, is I'm trying to educate other producers that they shouldn't build their studio big and I'm not doing that just out of I don't want competition, yeah. but like it really doesn't make sense to have all the stuff you need to record a drum set when you could come here for three hours and then go home and cut it up and gotcha. do it, it it doesn't make so, because you got to have the real estate for it. You got to have all the mic stands, all the mics. Then you got to have all the snare drums, all the toms. Like it doesn't. It financially, you'd be better off. It, the model around Utah has always been guys like you and me ha build our room and then yeah. it's that's Scott's room and that's Richard's room. And the model in LA or in New York or in Nashville is not that. The studio is a place that guys like you and me go to yeah. and then go back home. home and do all the And so I'm thinking, yeah. well, I want to create a studio that's that place for everybody else. And then you can go, hey, you know what would be awesome is to go use Scott's amps for a day yeah. and then we'll come back home. And, then, and I'll be like, great, it's this much for an hour. You can engineer it. You yeah. don't need me. Yeah. You need an assistant yeah. who can walk you through the room. Yeah. And then you record guitars all day and go home and then you know that's yeah. that's what we're moving towards because we'll have multiple studios so we're moving towards trying to invite more producers to say make your setup at home work for what you need come here for the things you know if you want a bunch of guitars or you want to do drums in a big room you come here you rent it for a couple hours and then you take off and you if you can run pro tools i can get help you get sounds if you don't know how to get drum sounds and then i'll take off yeah which is perfect you know I mean? because there's probably a million people out there that just have that little studio that you're talking and about. they don't need this no they don't need this <laughs> unless yeah. they want to have unless you want to have the overhead that comes along with this and have to take any client that comes in just to keep it busy yeah. if you want to just keep working with this the music you, you want, like yeah. then you should stay keep as small as you can gotcha. and then you come down here, hire me for an hour, I'll get your drum sounds, and then you know how to run Pro Tools, I'll yeah. take off. Cool. And then you can use our drums and get our drum sounds, and then you can go home, and then we'll have somebody else come in. Awesome. That's my thought. Cool. Well, hey, um, if you're watching this, all four of you, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's Scott Wiley, so maybe there's a million people oh, watching. Sure. Hey, lots of people. So subscribe to the channel. Um, I'm going to have more content. I appreciate Scott doing this for us. Uh, just an amazing studio. I didn't even crack the surface of some of the stuff he has in here <laughs> and stuff he does. Um, and as far as I can tell, I just barely met Scott. He seems like a great guy. Um, man, he loves talking about gear. So that like means gear. you are great. <laughs> in my eyes. Yeah. <laughs> Such an easy interview for me because Scott loves what he does. And you can tell just by looking at this place and by his attitude. And so go ahead and subscribe. And I appreciate you guys tuning in to Utah Producers. Thank you.